We're going to talk about who do men say that Jesus is. We're going to talk about the deity of Jesus Christ. And sometimes I wonder, and I know we do, but do we really realize who Jesus is? Do we, do we get the concept that he's actually God, the creator of the universe? But I want to give you a challenge to write the scriptures I have down. I've got a lot of scriptures tonight. So if you take nothing else away from you, you have these scriptures. And so I'm going to have you turn to some of them. Some of them I refer to them. And I want you to take them home, and I want, you to, I want to make you thirsty for who Jesus is. And I think that, that as we reach out to people, as we witness, can we really witness if we don't know ourselves? And I'm saying we don't know, but we do, do we realize that? Now, here in Matthew chapter 13, I want to jump ahead a little bit. Jesus is asking them, who do you think I am? In verse 20, I'm going to go forward and then come backwards, explain. And he says this, Matthew 16, 20, Jesus said, then he sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Have you ever wondered why Jesus kept telling them, don't tell anybody? He came to show himself God, but yet he told the disciples, don't tell anybody yet who the Son of Man is. And why did he do that? You know, why did he do that? But the disciples, I believe in reading that, they weren't ready to confirm as the Messiah. Their understanding of him was lacking. You think about it. They didn't understand the reason for the cross, why he had to suffer to the extent of a sacrifice. Even though they themselves, they had healed. They had seen Jesus healed. They healed. They performed miracles. They cast out demons. And they witnessed to multitudes. And they still really didn't have a deep personal revelation of who Jesus was. It wasn't registering to them. And the reason he didn't want them to know is he wanted them to be sure, before you ought witness, I want you to know who I am. Because how can we witness or show someone if we don't know for sure who that is and who God is? And that's the reason he didn't want to tell them that, because he wanted them to get a grasp, understanding of who he is, so that they could relay it to him. And he wanted to let them know what was going on there. But he first said, when Jesus came to this region of Caesarea and Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now, you think about that. What's well, a simple question? He's God. But do we really know that? Who do men say that I am? We're not talking about who do Christians. Who do men? Who does the world see him? Who do they say him? In fact, Jesus in his final few months of ministry, he's in his final few months there, he's getting ready to go to the cross, and people, especially his disciples, are still confused about who he is. And the people who see him do miracles, they say he's a great... A prophet, a great teacher, all of these. And right now he's alone with his disciples, and that's who he asked the question. And he began by asking his disciples what men were saying about his identity. Do they know who I am? And I believe Jesus was asking that question to see if they were listening to him or what others were saying about him. Were you listening to what other people were asking? Jesus was leading his disciples to a true proclamation of who he is. How can you proclaim something if you don't know who they are? And as we see there, they replied like, well, some say you're John the Baptist. In fact, Herod thought he was reincarnated as he had had Herod, he had had John the Baptist put to death and he thought God had reincarnated him. And some thought Elijah, but if he were only another man, talking about Jesus, he was a fraud because he claimed to be equal with God the Father. So he asked his disciples who they said that he was. I think it's very important that we understand. Because if God, Jesus is not God, then we're here in vain. Why are we worshiping if he is not God? If he's not the revelation he showed us? Then we're just like any other religion, any other feel-good religion, or how to better ourselves. And are we searching the scriptures, that I'm asking us here, to realize who Jesus is? Or are we going by what other people are saying? Many of the church is going by what other people are saying. And it may seem obvious to many of you, but you may be surprised to hear what non-believers say about Jesus. Oh, yeah, some people, oh, I believe in Jesus. They believe he existed, but do they believe in him? I've heard people tell me, I've talked to someone, that the Bible, I can't trust the Bible because it's full of errors. It contradicts himself. But then when you ask them to name one, they can't. They can't name a contradiction in the Bible. Unless we have a proper understanding and appreciation of the person of Jesus Christ, 
like I said, we have no value in our religion. Why are we wasting our time? We might as well eat, drink, and be happy. And, and it all centers around on de the deity of Jesus Christ. And really, believe it or not, many confessing Christians don't really totally realize who Jesus is. He's God. And I'm going to go through some scriptures, like I say. And, but when you ask, who do men say they am? Let me give you some religions and cults, what they say. <laughs> some say that Jesus is a man who achieved great things and became God with what he did. That's the Mormons or the Latter-day Saints. And many times people say, well, you know, they're just another Christian group that is a little bit off. But no, Mormons are not Christians because they don't believe in the unique Son of God. They say Jesus was a pre-existent spirit. They say that he was the brother of Lucifer. And there's, you know, uh, since... Uh, God chose Jesus for this. Lucifer got mad. He got ticked off and he went off and rebelled. We're all, they say, we're all little brothers of sis and sisters in Christ. He says, we are deity. We can become deity. We're literal, unique brothers and sisters. But he was the firstborn of the spirit children. We existed before. In fact, in their doctrine of the covenants, it says, and now verily I say to you, talking to people, I was born in the beginning with the Father, and I am the firstborn, and all those who are begotten through me are partakers of the glory of the same, and are the church of the firstborn. Ye were also in the beginning with the Father. Oh, you know, what a false teaching. So what does the Bible say about that statement? You know, we can look at it. We wanted to compare everything to what the Bible says. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 5 starts it off. If you want to turn to Genesis chapter 3, 1 through 5, and in the back, I'm going to ask you to turn to Isaiah 14 in just a minute. But Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. And I'm going to read through it, and we'll, we'll comment on it. He says, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. He didn't say that. If you do, you'll die. And he didn't say surely die. He says you'll die. And, and Satan says you won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. And you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. And that's what the Mormon doctrine teaches, that we have become God. And, and so he says, you know, you won't die. He tried to get him to question that. And Satan has always begun to question those things. In Isaiah 14, chap or verses, uh, chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. And it tells you there, for Satan, he says, How you are fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning. You have been thrown down to the earth, you who destroyed the nations of the world. For you said to yourself, I will descend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high. Instead, you will be brought down to the place of the dead, down to the lowest depths. God tells him, and, and that's when Satan fell. He, he became a, a, one of the beautiful anointed cherubs. And he told him that, you know, I'm going to be like God. And he uses I, I, I over and over again. And you see how man wants to be like God. We want to be our own gods. Another one, the Jehovah's Witness. They say that Jesus is a created being who is given the status of second in command. That somehow or another, he's not equal to the Father. And they say this. They say Jesus is a God, but not the almighty God. And they're the ones who tell you there's only one God. He is, not, he is a God, but not the almighty God. They say that he is the second greatest person of the universe. He was created individually with a beginning. In fact, they go on to say this. This is crazy. They say that before he came to earth, he was Michael the archangel and in his preexistent state with a brother named Lucifer. Think about that. 
a Jehovah's Witness. Notice the plug that Satan always gives himself with both of these religions, uh, the point that he was the brother of Jesus. Somehow he got the raw deal and is believed. But when Michael came to earth, he was transformed into a man. And so they believed that there was really no bodily resurrection. They believed that when he came to earth, he died, and the Father God, from his memory, recreated him, and he went to heaven as a ghost. And now, again, he's Michael the archangel. They say he didn't die on a cross, he died on a stake. Okay? And, again, he was recreated from God's memory. Here's the passages they use. They twist the scripture. John 14, 28. They say, my father is greater than I. Well, at first glance, you think, well, that makes sense. But it seems to contradict all that Jesus had taught, but there is no contradiction here. If you understand the scripture, it says the father wasn't greater as God. As a man, Jesus was temporarily in a lower position. He came down from his throne. Hebrews 2.9. Turn with me to Hebrews 2.9. I want you to see that. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. And I think that'll put this to rest. And like I say, write these scriptures down. You're taking notes and examining them and look over and over again. He says, what do we see is, what we do see is Jesus, who for a little while was given a position a little lower than the angels. And because he suffered death for us, he is now crowned with glory and honor. Yes, by God's grace, Jesus tasted death for everyone. He came down as our next of kin. He is still God, but he came down and put into this body and died for us. So, as far as deity is concerned, the Son and the Father are equal. There's no difference. And this refers to the voluntary submission or rank during his earthly existence, not as a person. He voluntarily came and suffered and became us for, for what he was going to do. Revelations 3.14 says this, Write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is one they use to say that he was second in command. This is the message from the one who is the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. Think about that. And that's a crucial verse they use. It says that he is the beginning of the creation of God. So when he created, Jesus was created first before he did that. So he, he created a second command. But it does not mean that he was the first person to be created because he was never created. He began all creation. Jesus began creation. He was the agent of creation. And it doesn't say that he had a beginning. It says that he is the beginning. Does that make sense? Number one, he began creation. Number two, he is the beginning. Everything began with him if there was a beginning, and there wasn't. He's really saying that Christ was the active source or the author. He is the beginning of God's creation. And as you think these things through and compare them with other verses and put them into context, you understand and you have a, a, a greater view that this God who created the universe actually came down and put himself as a body of man and actually died for us. And it says that while we were still sinners, he died for us. It wasn't like, hey guys, if you'll just listen to what I say, if you'll say you're sorry and shine my shoes, stuff like that, I'll forgive you. No, while they still hated him, he died for them. It's amazing to me. Colossians 1.15. I'll read that. You don't have to turn there. But write that down. Colossians 1.15. It says that, talking about Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So there's another one they use. They say not only was he a beginning, but now they said he was the firstborn over all creation. Now, if I didn't know better, I'd think, okay, he was the firstborn. It makes sense. But he says that he was the image of the invisible God. See, Jesus has enabled us to see what God is like. God is spirit, and therefore God's invisible. Okay? So we can't see God. But 
In the person of Jesus Christ, God made himself visible to our eyes. He came down so that we might see. It's kind of like he was the interpreter. He came down that we might see him in a human body. John 14, 9, Jesus said this, Whoever has seen him, the Father, or seen Jesus, has seen the Father. Pretty up front. <laughs> if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And there's no mistaking on that when you look at it. But Jehovah's Witnesses say that Christ was the first to be created. But the expression firstborn over, over all creation, he said earlier, has nothing to do with his birth. He existed before our creation. And listen, he occupies a position of supremacy over it all. The first fruits, in, in, when you look at it, it, was the best. It was the perfection of everything. He, was, he has eminence and dominion over creation. He holds all things together. Turn with me to Colossians 1. I'm going to have you turn to Colossians 1 now. Verses 16 and 17. Colossians 1, verses 16 and 17. And again, this is going to be very plain if you look at Scripture. Colossians 1, 16 and 17. And what they're saying, that he was the firstborn over creation, but they stopped short. Jehovah's Witness stopped short of, of uh, 16 and 17. And besides what he says, let me, let me, that first one says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. They stopped there. But if you go to 16, he says, for through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see. He's talking about Jesus such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Listen to this. Everything was created through him and for him. Talking about Jesus. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. He didn't say he was born before anything else. He said before anything else was, he already existed. Now, don't ask me to explain that. The Bible doesn't tell us that. But we know that he always existed. I don't know if, you're, if you care if you're an atheist or whatever you believe. You have to understand at one point, someplace, something had to have existed. Something had to have always been there. That, that's as far as my little pea brain can explain. But no matter what you believe, it had to have been there. And that was Jesus. It says, Christ is the creator of all things. He has a preeminent position. And the Old Testament Hebrew meaning of first fruit was the choicest of the fruits. It was the perfection. He was perfect man. He was 100% God, 100% man. We'll talk about it in just a minute. Then you think, well, I won't spend as much time on these, but the Unification Church are Moonies. You heard so much about them, especially in the 70s. And they say that Jesus was a man no better than we are. He was just a man. Reverend Moon says Jesus is not God himself. In fact, he says that Moon was chosen to complete Christ's work because he was a failure. He didn't do it because they, they ended up uh, messing up. They sent to the cross. He died. And it says no matter how great a value Christ is, he cannot assume any greater value than man. That he's no better than us. In fact, he says that, that man can excel what Jesus did. He gave an example. He didn't quite get it. He didn't do it all. He failed. So we can do the same thing and even excel what Jesus had done. The Way International, I don't know if anybody for fear there was very, very, uh, a few years ago was uh, very prominent, but it says that Jesus' existence began in his conception. Again, he was created. Islam says Jesus is a prophet and messenger of God. They believed in Jesus. They mentioned Jesus several times. I think maybe something like 99 times there. But it says that Jesus was only a messenger of Allah. Okay? And he didn't die. He got out of it. He didn't die on the cross. Said that he was a sinless prophet who never achieved the greatness of Muhammad. Muhammad had to come step in and completely fill from that one. Could you imagine Jesus being in the Quran as violent as it is? And in atheism... I don't believe in atheists, to tell you the truth. I really don't. But they say Jesus is less than most people think he is. 
There is no God. And, and to me, atheism makes no sense at all. It makes no sense at all. They said he's not who he says he is. And then the Unitarian Church says that Jesus was a great moral teacher. If he was a great moral teacher, he'd be no different than Confucius, no different than Vashti, no different than all of these came and showed us the way, but they didn't pay their way. In fact, William Channing said Christ was sent to earth as a great moral teacher rather than a mediator. He showed you how to get there, but he wasn't going to do it for you. If that were true, if our, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer, which I've seen a lot of them in the pulpit. But our greatest need was forgiveness. So God sent us a savior. We, he came and did something we couldn't do our own. own. And the New Age thinkers, just a couple more, says that Jesus is a mystic medium. He's an avatar, he's a channeler. He's our guide to self-actualization. Could you imagine self-actualization? Years ago in the 70s, it was kind of that way. It says, you need to find yourself. Well, I found myself, and I didn't like it. I never looked for me again. But one of the, and he was one of many avatars, ancient avatars, who channels a spiritual glimpse into the past. And through previous incarnations, he attained a level of purity. That's a big job. Carl Jung's psychology says, Jesus is a projection of our needs. He's a crutch to fall back on. And people say, wait a minute, Jesus isn't a crutch. I beg to differ. To me, he's an entire body cast because he keeps me together. And I can lean on him. So I have no problem if Jesus is a crutch. Again, he's a cast. He holds us together. And then as we go along... We see who people said he was in, in verse 15 and 16 back in Matthew. He said, then he asked them, but who do you say I am? And Simon Peter, one was, you know, Simon Peter was, he had the gift of foot and mouth. But at this time, he really came up with the answer. He says, Simon Peter answered, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. Think about that. Jesus asked him, I know what the world now, what, what they say, but who do you say that I am? But let's find out that. Here's the claims of the New Testament. I'm just going to give you the scripture reference. I'm not going to read them for time's sake. Here's the claims of the Old Testament about who Jesus was. Isaiah 7.14 said that he would be born of a virgin. Matthew 1.23 fulfilled that. Do you know that every... Um, prophecy that was talked about Jesus, every one, there's not, he hasn't missed one. Every one has come true. But said he was born of a virgin. And that's the thing that a lot of people have a problem with. Rob Bell, who is one of the emergent movements years ago, and his remark about the virgin birth, and I just don't like it. He said, <clears throat> what if you found out that Jesus wasn't wasn't born of a virgin. What if he, he was born to a father named Larry? And what if they took DNA and found out that he was truly had an earthly father? And he went through that. And he says, would it really matter? Yeah, it would matter. But that's, that's, it, if you reject the virgin birth, you reject the deity of Jesus. And it does mean a lot. The Bible said in Micah 5.2, says that he was born in Bethlehem. And we know Matthew 2.5 and many of them that he was born in Bethlehem. In Numbers 24.8, says that he, was, he would be found in Egypt. He would be escaped to Egypt and be found there. Matthew 2.15 says they went to escape Herod and he was found there and came out of Egypt. Isaiah 53.4 said that he would heal many. And in Matthew 8.16 again, you see healing and many others all through the Gospels. Isaiah 53, 12 literally said he would be crucified. This was before anybody heard of crucifixion. In Matthew 27, 38, we see that was fulfilled. And in Psalms 34, 20, that says there would be no bones broken. And John 19, 32 to 36, said there's not wasn't a, a bone broken on him. 
What are the odds? What are the odds? The Messiah's coming was an expected event on religious calendars. He, he told them. You look through the book of Exodus. All the signs, the pictures of Jesus Christ. I love the book of Exodus. I love to teach the whole thing one time. I did it years ago. And it's almost like a photograph of who Jesus is. They also told us that he would have a quality known <clears throat> to no other man. Do you know what that quality is? He's almighty God. Isaiah 7, 14. He said, all right then, the Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child and she will give birth to a son and you will call him Emmanuel. You know what Emmanuel means? God is with us. God is with us. He said, God is with us, not God, a God with us. He said, God, almighty God with us. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. See, the, the Messiah is not only a ruler, but he would be Mighty God. Over and over again, Scripture tells us that. And that's the same word in Isaiah 10, 21, saying that the remnant of Jacob will return to the mighty God. And that's Jesus Christ. So, it leaves us with two conclusions, okay? Number one, the prophets are telling us that another mighty God would be coming, giving us two gods, okay? But that contradicts Isaiah, contradicts Isaiah 45, 22, when it says, let all the world look to me for salvation, for I am God, <clears throat> and there is no other. The other conclu uh, conclusion and is that Jehovah, whom Isaiah worshipped, and the child who would be born and called mighty God are the same. And that's the conclusion we see from that. Micah 5.2. Micah 5.2 says this. I'll read it in the New King James. <clears throat> But you, Bethlehem, Epaphrana, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be the ruler in Israel. This is important. Who going on forth have been from old, from everlasting, eternity. He, everything he did was from eternity. And so no one can say that he had lived forever except who? God. Over and over again, you see this. So, if only God has existed from eternity past, and the Bible says Jesus existed with him, he has to be God. So what does the New Testament say about him? Viewpoint of the Apostle John in John 1. We're familiar with that. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were created. Without him nothing was created that has been created. And in him was life, and that life was the light of man. One of my favorite, John, one of my favorite scriptures, says, in the beginning. Okay, let's think about that. What beginning was he talking about? And I love, if you listen to J. Vernon McGee, he's got this southern drawl. But he says this, and I love this, he says, there are three beginnings in scripture. Number one, we go back to Genesis 1 and 1, and he says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know, automatically we sometimes think, well, that was the, that was the first beginning. It wasn't. Genesis assumes the existence of God. In fact, it was the beginning of heaven and earth. It was the beginning of when God created all these. So that was the first beginning. It was just the beginning of what we see as the heavens and the earth, Okay. Now, the second beginning, he says, is in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. If you want to turn now, read there. 1 John, we've been going through 1 John in our uh, men's discipleship, and it's so, so opening to who it is. But 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. This is, the sec this is one of the other beginning, okay? It says, we proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. 
This one who is life itself was revealed to us, and we, talking about the disciples, have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is, has eternal life, who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with him, and our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. In fact, that beginning was the incarnation, the beginning of his incarnation coming down as a human. So we see the beginning of heavens and earth. We see the beginning of his incarnation here on earth. Okay? And then we go to John 1.1, 1, 1, and that is the beginning, which has no beginning. All right? The beginning that has no beginning. He said, in the beginning was the word. You know what the word was means? Word, and that word, it means continuous existence. It always was. It always will be. Not just, it used to be. It's continuous existence. The word there is the word lagos or logos. Okay? We get the word logo. And lagos actually means to put words side by side, to speak words in an order that they understand, to express an opinion. In other words, Jesus came where we could see him. It's almost like I may have different words, and I can say the, this, all of these, but I have to put them side by side into a word that makes sense. That's what Jesus was, the Lagos. He revealed God. We could see him through that. So Christ is the revealer of God, and he is God. He is the very being and mind of God, and then he says, the word was with God. In the beginning, he didn't say there was a beginning. Before anything existed, always that he was with God. So what does that tell you? And so we talk about that. So wait a minute. If God was always there, why don't we, why wasn't he mentioned in the Old Testament? He was. There are many appearances of Jesus Christ. He appeared to Jacob. Remember in Genesis 48, 16, he said, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil. And that angel was messenger, and who can redeem but only God? And Manoah in Judges 13, Judges 13, 17 through 18, he said, then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, you know, when you see the angel of the Lord, that's, those are appearances of Jesus Christ. He said this, how do I know? Well, listen to what he says. He said, what is your name, that when your words come to pass, we may honor you? And the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? Wonderful, counselor, almighty God. Isaiah 9, 6. In Genesis 16, we know that uh, the, the angel of the Lord appeared to Hagar when she was cast out by Sarah, and he came and gave her a promise. Remember Abraham? We all know Abraham. Genesis 18, 1. The Lord appeared again to Abraham near the oak grove belonging to Mamre. He appeared to him. Remember there were three angels, there was the other one, and, and the three went on, and the one stayed back and talked to God. In Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Love that story. Wait a minute, where does that come from? Well, let me tell you. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Nebuchadnezzar, sorry for what he said, but threw them into the burning fire pit. And he came down and he looked. And, and he was, even though he had to do it because of the law, he, 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 look, he answered, I see four men. How many did you throw in there? Three. I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. He was there. You think about it. Well, we go through fires, we go through tribulations, we wonder, God, where are you? God's there. And God feels it more than we do. But he was there. He appeared there. And he said the word was God. The word has existed from all eternity. Okay? John 8, 58. He said, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was ever born, I am. I said, well, that's bad grammar. You know what I am means? Again, eternal existence. Someone who existed eternally. He said, before Abraham was, I already existed. And I am literally, again, means timeless existence. Like was. 
Colossians 1.17, I'm referring back to that, says he existed before anything else, and he holds all of creation together. He holds everything together in his hand. You know, the old song, he got the whole world in his hand, means a lot more than you know. If you looked away or just let holy grass, could you imagine? The word has enjoyed eternal fellowship with the Father. And the Greek phrase that John used here can literally be translated, he was face to face with God. Face to face. Christ had perfect fellowship with his Father in eternity past. John 17, 5 says this. John 17, 5. I like the way the New King James Version says. He says, when he's praying, and now, Father, he's going to go to the cross, and now, O oh, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I mean, it's so obvious. And he said the word was God, or literally, God was the word. God was the word. He was fully God at his death and resurrection. He was fully God at his birth. In fact, Colossians 2.9, I know I go back to Colossians a lot. He says, for in Christ lives all the fullness of, body, of God in a human body. All the fullness, completeness of God in a human body. You know, think about that. Can you imagine putting God into a human body? It's like stuffing a whale into a thimble. Or even worse than that. It's, it's the only thing I can imagine. But we have to conclude that Jesus is God. And, and I want to talk about the, the viewpoint of Apostle Paul. I just got a few more coming up. Romans 9, 5, <clears throat> Paul said, Christ himself was an Israelite as far as his human nature is concerned. And he is God, the one who rules over everything and is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. So be it. Who is worthy of praise? God. Every time an angel bowed down to John in Revelation or any time in the Old Testament, he's hold on, don't worship me. But every time you see him bow down and if the angel of the Lord accepts it, you know it's Christ. You know it's the appearance there. I mean, it, you don't really need to explain that. Philippians 2, 5 and 6. Philippians 2, 5 and 6 said, <clears throat> Let this mind be in you which also is in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God did not consider a robber to be equal to God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. And listen to this, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. So we see Jesus in both of his essential natures. He's not 50% God and 50% man. If he was, then he'd be a Greek God or he'd be Hercules. He is 100% God, 100% man. And I don't have time to go in it, but if you study the Ark of the Covenant, you see a picture of Christ. You know, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant was made of the, the, the hardest wood and it was pure gold. Wood in the Bible always represents man and gold represents deity. So it was God and man wrapped together. That's as far as I can explain it. But God himself voluntarily laid aside his majesty and humbled himself on the cross. <clears throat> Philippians 2, verses 10 through 11, says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God would not allow anyone other than himself to be worshipped because it would violate the first commandment. No other God before you, beside you. No other God. <clears throat> Titus 2.13. I told you I was going to give you a lot of scriptures, so write these down. While you're at it, I won't read it, but put, put down 1 Timothy 3.16. But Titus 2.13 says, While we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ will be revealed. He, to the whole world, they're going to look and say, wow, he was God. It's going to be too late. It's going to be too late. What did Christ say about his deity? I heard uh, a prosperity preacher, I'm not even going to mention his name, <clears throat> but he said that Christ never said that he was God. Well, John 8 56 and through 58, 
He said, John told him, he says, your father Abraham rejoiced as he looked forward to my coming. He saw it and was glad. And the people said, you aren't even 50 years old. How can you say you have seen Abraham? And Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was even born, I am. Before he was even born, I eternally existed. John 10, 24 through 30, <clears throat> three points he said, Jesus called God his father, not our father. He called the father as being the unique father. I had, when I had surgery years ago, I had the, um, the anesthesiologist, or actually the cardiologist. <clears throat> he was Mormon, and he found out that I was a pastor. And right before he was going to put me under, he said, well, what would, you, what would you do if I told you I was Mormon? So I thought, Mike, use your words very carefully, because he's got a knife. I'm only teasing and I looked at him and I says, well, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the one and only unique son of God, then you're saved. He looked at me and goes, hmm, get out of that one. No, but just, and I added unique. He claimed to give eternal life and he said, the father and I are one. <clears throat> Thomas said to him in John 14, 5, Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going and how we can know the way. Jesus said to him, I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Isn't that amazing? And the people that, that observed Jesus in Matthew 21, 15 through 16, he said, but when the chief priests and scribes <clears throat> say the wonderful things, saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant and said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you ever read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants? You have perfected praise or glory or worship. You know what the word Hosanna means? Save us, we pray. Who can save? Only God. And verse 17 of... of um, of uh, Matthew 16 he said Jesus replied after Simon said this revelation you're blessed Simon son of John because my father in heaven has revealed this to you you did not learn that from any human being that was revealed to you by God see Peter was sort of the sports the spokesman for the 12 he was always ready to speak up and in this case it was a pretty good thing he said he probably speaking on behalf of the 12 disciples they probably talked about it and it was not the first time disciples confessed Jesus as God. But he said, he wanted them to understand, Simon, that's what I've been trying to tell you. And God revealed that to him. In John 1, Nathaniel declared Jesus was the Messiah. When Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree. Matthew 14, when Jesus walked on the water to rescue the disciples of the storm, they said, truly, you are the Son of God. So they, they, they've got glimpses of it. They saw that he was. But what made this time so different? What made it different than those other times? We thought they figured it out, but they kept dropping the ball. They had saw these times where he knew he was God. But what made this difference? This is the first time anybody confessed Jesus as the Messiah without any special miracle or prophetic comment of Jesus. The Holy Spirit revealed it to him. Peter, when he confessed that Jesus was, it was God the Father revealing who Jesus was through Peter. And it was based on the logical conclusions that what he saw in Jesus. And I want to finish with this last verse. <clears throat> verse 18. He said, Now I say to you, you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. That's a very controversial scripture. It shouldn't be to the Catholic Church. You know, they believe that, that, that Peter was the first pope. They believe that Peter wasn't married, but Peter did have, you know, because Jesus healed his mother-in-law. But they believe that the church is built on Peter. That's not what he's saying. The word Peter means little stone. Okay, Jesus is saying that upon this rock, I will build my church. And he said, Peter, you're a little stone. You're part of that. But the word for rock is a different word than the, the word for Peter. 
There's this gigantic, the rock is the revelation of what God had given him. He said, Peter, you're a little rock. That's a good thing. But upon this rock, I will build my church. He's saying he will build his church on the confession by Peter <clears throat> that Jesus is God. The church is built on the fact that who Jesus is. And it's built on Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5. 1 Peter 2, verse 4 through 5. You are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He's rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones. I'm talking about we are living stones. We're not the rock. But the living stones that God is building into a spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifice that please God. And he says this, the gates of hell will not prevail. We can go through hard times, we can go through things, but the gates of hell will not prevail. In fact, I'm going to finish with this first, 1 John 4.4. 4. And this is something I think we need to realize. And this is a promise that we have. And I want to leave you with this. 1 John 4.4. 4. But you belong to God, my dear children. You've already won a victory over the, the, over the world, over these people. Because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Oh, if I could only know that all the time. When you come into spiritual warfare, when you see that, that this spirit that is in the world or the spirit I have is stronger than the spirit that is in the world. Father, we thank you for the revelation of who you are, that you are God. We thank you, God, for revealing who you are, coming to die for us, and we worship you as God. And we pray that these scriptures, and I pray that we would take them seriously and look at them and study them, know them, so that we can come out and tell who you are and that we believe who you are. Lord, we love you and we thank you, Lord. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.